Uh, you might find a seat, and if you can go to Genesis 31, you'll find our verses this morning. Genesis 31, just a few things before we jump into our verses of Scripture. Um, Elsa wants to thank you for your kind cards that you've sent to her. She can't respond individually to everyone, but she wants you to know that she appreciates your love and concern. Uh, she states to us that though her body is failing, her spirit is still rejoicing in the Lord. So thank you for your kindness. Um, question of the month. What is baptism? And that's a good question. Baptism is a holy ordinance to be administered with water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, signifying our engrafting into Christ and the partaking of the benefits of the covenant of grace in our engagement and our engagement to be the Lord's. It's always this question about baptism is, how long do you wait to baptize somebody who's of a mature, understanding mind? Because the scripture is really fast. Ethiopian eunuch, man, a couple hours. Philippian jailer and his family, a couple hours and at midnight they were baptized. And so, yeah, we want people to understand what they're doing, but we don't want to wait, you know, 15 years to, just to make sure they understand the whole counsel of God before they, they come to the water. That'd be impossible. So anyways, that's baptism. Something very strange happened this week. Uh, I was preparing for today's sermon, and uh, I realized come Friday, Saturday, that I skipped the end of chapter 30 of Genesis. And I said, oh, so what? So we're just going to plug away. We'll do that sermon some other time. So whatever happens today, if God says anything to your heart at all, that's why this has happened. So we're in 31 today, and we'll do 30, the end of 30 some other time. It's about the speckled plants and the calves, and you know what it is. Anyways, um, I don't really, Old Testament narratives are really hard to, hard to bring home, so it's just not information. I'll tell you the story, and you go home and you heard a good story. What we want is we want to draw out what is here for us, and sometimes it's not that easy, because none of us are going to live the life of Jacob exactly, will we? We won't go 500 miles from our home, find a couple of wives, come back with 20 kids or 12 kids. That's just not going to happen to us. But it happened to Jacob. So I was thinking about the Apostle Paul when he writes to the Corinthian church. He says that the Old Testament people were under the cloud of Moses, and they all drank from this, from this rock, the spiritual food, and that rock was Christ. Now, if I read that Old Testament story in Exodus, I don't necessarily hear the word, oh, the rock was Christ. It doesn't say that. But Paul says that's what it was. And he says, these stories are an example for us. That's what they're there for. So this morning, God willing, will draw something out that'll be an example for you and I from the life of Jacob. I'm going to go first 16 verses, then kind of spot read as we go through the rest of the sermon. So please hear the word of God this morning. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's sons, saying... Hey, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what belonged to our father, he has made all this wealth. Jacob saw that the attitude of Laban, and behold, it was not friendly toward him as formerly. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to his flock in the field, and said to them, I see your father's attitude that is not friendly toward me as formerly, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. However, God did not allow him to hurt me. If he spoke thus, the speckled sheep shall be, be, be your wages, then all the flock brought forth speckled. And if he spoke thus, the stripes shall be your wages, then all the flock brought forth striped. Thus God has taken away your father's livestock and given them to me. And it came about that the time when the flock were mating that I lifted my eyes and I saw in a dream, and behold, the male goats which were mating were striped, speckled, and molted. And the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob... And I said, Here I am. He said, Lift up your eyes now, and see all that the male goats which have mating are striped, speckled, and molted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. Rachel and Leah said to him, Do we still have any portion or inheritance in our father's house? 
Are we not reckoned by him as foreigners? For he has sold us and has also entirely consumed our purchase price. Surely all the wealth which God has taken away from our father belongs to us and our children. Now then do whatever God has said to you. That is the word of God. Let's pray. God be with us as we unfold these thoughts before you this morning. Help us to hear your spirit teach our souls about things that are eternal and needed and important. So guide us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I probably mentioned this way, this in a different form before, but when I was growing up, the Christianity in my home that my parents were modeling for me was the Christianity that my mom had modeled to her when she was a child. And that Christianity was more sometimes about all the don'ts. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Almost sort of a fundamentalist kind of almost rule-keeping Christianity. Um, And it didn't deal with too much about delight. Delighting, thirsting, and hungering. It was always don't, don't, don't. Don't have long hair. Don't wear ripped up blue jeans. You know, everything is don't, 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 don't. And that's all I heard. At least that's all I heard as a young person growing up. Now, it was funny that in my parents' defense, they, they tried to hide things from us as kids. Things that they felt might not be appropriate for young children to find. But as kids, we knew where everything in the house was. I mean everything. Because we'd play hide and seek. And deep back in one of the walk-in closets, I'd be hiding it. What is that poking me in the side of my ribs? And it'd be a bottle of that special adult juice that they didn't want the kids to see because that wouldn't be appropriate. Or there were the LPs, the, the record albums that maybe had something on the cover that wasn't really appropriate, like Engelbert Humperdinck, is that his name? And uh, there'd be this lady covered all with whipped cream, though she had a, probably a bathing suit underneath, and that was all hidden, so we wouldn't find those things as kids because everything was about don't, don't, don't. Well, my Christianity took a turn when I was 19 years old. This August will be my 40th year walking with Jesus. I can't, 40 years, don't, praise God, not praise me, praise Him. At that moment, it was no longer about the don'ts. It was about hungering and thirsting, wanting more of Christ, understanding who God was, being known and knowing Him deep in my soul, treasuring the greatest treasure of all, the Christ that died for me. That became my passion. That was not about just a bunch of don'ts. Of course, there's things we shouldn't do. But my world became more about a thirsting, a hungering, a seeking, a wanting him to be near to me. That was the Christianity that I began to pursue and still pursue today. Jesus would make a distinction for us. We have to live in this world, don't we? But we don't have to be of this world. We work in this place, we go to school in this place, we have to shop in this place. We are in this place, this world around us, this fallen world. We're no longer in the Garden of Eden, but we don't have to be of this place. We don't have to have our minds and our hearts always just focused on the temporary things, the things that are rotting and rusting, that we can have both a mind to deal with the things we have to do with here, to glorify Him, and also have an eternal vision about things that are forever. Jacob is going to be asked to leave where he is. He is in the world of Laban, his uncle, who has been abusing him sorely, trying to suck out of Jacob every ounce of strength so Laban's pockets could be filled with coin. And like this world, I mean, this world's an evil place. It will sorely abuse your heart if you let it. Sin, my friend, is a cruel taskmaster, and it will beat you into submission. It will use you. It will suck the life right out of you if you allow it to. Jacob, it's time to leave Laban's little world. It's time to go back to the to the land of your forefathers, to the land of your relatives, to the place where faith can grow. Faith can then be free because in Laban's little world, it's not going to happen. The doctrine this morning is going to be this. This is real simple. It's time to come home. 
Krishna, it's, it's, it's time to stop playing out in the world. I know we have to work in the place. I know we have to shop in the place. I know we have to... But you know something? We don't have to be of the place. We don't have to value everything the world values. We can value things beyond that. I know there are things that are going to overlap. We're told to value family, and family is a wonderful thing. But we don't value family just in the way the world values family. Like Jacob, we're going to view family with an eternal perspective. What my family is going to leave behind after I go from this place. What will they leave behind when I go? Will there still be a sense, a smell, an aroma of Christ? J Jacob, you got to go. you got to go back home. And first of all this morning is the command. The command to leave. Found in verses 1 through 3. And I love the timing because Laban's sons are all ticked off. The brother-in-laws of Jacob are really ticked because Jacob, by God's power, has become wealthy as God has had his flocks multiply and Laban's flocks decrease. And, of course, the brothers, the brothers Laban, they're all upset. My inheritance, it's gone. They weren't upset when their sisters, Rachel and Leah, were bartered for a price to have Jacob stay. But now they're mad because their pockets are emptying out. And it says that Laban's face, literally, was contorted towards Jacob. He no longer was being viewed as friendly. And I thought about that little picture there. And I remembered one day when somehow, I, I was in high school and, we must have gotten lost on the way to high school, and we ended up at Hampton Beach. I don't know how that happened, but we got lost, just a little misguided. And I remember coming home a little bit later than usual, and my mother was sitting on the front porch. And her face was contorted. And it was not friendly like it was when I left for school that morning. That's what Jacob sees in Laban. Something is not right. And Jacob, it doesn't matter what Laban feels. It doesn't matter what Laban says, what he threatens with the man, what word game he tries to play, what gestures are on. It doesn't matter. God has commanded you, go. Go back to the land where you belong. Because your soul, Jacob, doesn't belong in Laban's little funhouse. His little world of using you. No, your soul is Yahweh's soul. And you need to be back where Yahweh's promises are named. That's where you need to be. There needs to be a certain, a certain kind of break that must take place. And folks, I just... I don't know if it fits the text perfectly, but that's what I had to do when I was 19. I had to say, I'm done. Uh, the, 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 the world that I knew, it was a dead end. My friends were godless. They just didn't have a, an eternal compass in their brain. And it was time to go home. It was time to be with God's people. And for me, I decided to go to Bible college. I know that's not what you're going to go do, but that's what I had to go do. And God used that, but... Jacob, it's time to get out of Laban's little fun house, and it's time to return to the place of your forefathers. Take your family, take your kids, travel the 500 miles plus, and get back to the land of promise. Jacob really could not remain in that cultural context with Laban. He had to actually break away and make that choice because he had already birthed 11 of the tribesmen who will be the heads of the houses of Israel. And that's not where they belong. They don't believe in Laban's little world. And by the way, neither do you. Christian, I know you got to work out there. I understand that. And you got to do things out there, but you don't have to be of the world. Anytime one of our beloved church people, friends or members, disappears for a while and they stop interacting with God's people and all they're doing is interacting with the world's people, what are they going to start thinking like? The world. You can't help it. You're human. Culture will have a pressure on us. Culture will, will mold and manipulate us. And that's why Paul says in Romans chapter 12, be transformed 
by the renewing of your mind. Don't be molded by the culture around you. So when you separate from the people of God, who's molding your, your brain? Who's molding your heart and your soul? Jacob, you got to leave Laban's little world. And I want you to go back home. And I want you to make the people of promise, Abraham, your granddaddy, and your father, Isaac, I want you to make those the people that you surround yourself with. So, we keep stating this over and over again, that Jesus is not a bodiless head. You get what I'm saying? He's not a bodiless, he's the head, and that means he has a body, and you are the body. We have an opportunity this morning, because I'll finish my sermon before noontime, to have a small, short, little business meeting to hear five testimonies of people who have come to know the Lord. So we need at least 25 of you folks to just to give us a few minutes of your time. Because they want to start serving right away, and they can't serve in the capacities they want to serve unless they're members. So that's why we're doing it this way. But anyways, five, five people are saying, I've, I've come out of the land of Laban, and I'm really in the land of promise now. That's who I am. So please, please stick around. So that's the idea of the, that's the, uh, the command. What about the conditions? What's it like to live in Laban's world? Well, look at verse 24. God has to actually speak to Laban and say, God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream of the night and said to him, Be careful, buddy. Oh, it doesn't say that, but I'm just going to put that in there. Be careful that you do not speak to Jacob either good or bad. And then go to verse 29. Look what Laban says. It is in my power to do your harm, but you're God. Because I'd like to harm you. I'd like to nail you for all the stuff you stole of mine, which actually he didn't steal it, though he's going to be accused of doing so. And this idea of threat that Laban comes with, and God says, don't you speak anything good or bad of this person. Have you been in that context where everything you do is not good enough, and you can feel it on the back of your neck? You serve and you serve and you sacrifice and you give and you give and you give and you try, and, you, and it's just... Jacob probably has that in the back of his neck when it comes to Laban. Because Laban's a cheat. He'll steal from you. He'll rip you off. He will do what he has to do. And, and Laban, his actions are constantly taking that because he loves the mammon of unrighteousness. So, don't be surprised in the world in the world of Laban, that you have to live in sometimes, folks, that your workmates aren't going to be operating from the same value system as you do as a Christian. Don't be surprised if they'll use you to get a promotion. Don't be surprised if the world will look, overlook you to make themselves have a better position than you. Don't be surprised. That's Laban's world. That's what Laban does with Jacob. He sorely abuses him to fill his own pockets with the gold of this world because that's his highest end. Jesus would say something like this, Stop toiling for that which does not prosper. Stop it. Stop it. Isaiah would say this, Why do you spend money on that which is not bread? Why do you keep on buying that which cannot satisfy? Because that's Laban. And Jacob, he's going to use you. He's going to suck out of you every ounce of strength because he just doesn't care about you. You know who cares about you people? The people around you. The people who name themselves as Christians. That when you go through a difficult time, guess what? They're praying for you. They're thinking about you. They want to know how's it going. And when you're not here and they can't physically see you with their eyes, they're like, how are they doing? Are they, are they okay? Laban doesn't care. He just cares about what he can get out of Jacob. The people of God are like, what can we give one another as a gift to one another? Christ's words would be something like this. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? So you get the whole world. What do you got? You got a rusting, rotted planet is what you got. That's all that you get. That's why I, 
Let's go back 18 plus years. Remember Ethel Smith? Ethel Smith was freed from the unrighteousness of mammon. You know, she married the first pastor's son. So when Ethel was here with us in her late 90s into the century mark, you had somebody who went all the way back to the beginning. Um, and Ethel called me one day and we sat and talked because she was still sharp upstairs, um, very good with numbers, almost 100 years old. And she said to me, she said, Pastor Steve, <clears throat> I want to do something good before I die. I said, okay. What is it you want to do? I want to give my GE stock to the church. I said, okay. That'd be nice. Thinking maybe a couple of thousand. That'd be a nice gift, wouldn't it? We had to call our family to make sure that she was, they were okay with this because it was dealing with some money. And when we cashed in her GE stock, it was valued at $144,000. And we paid off the mortgage of this place, which was killing us in our budget, $37,000 a year. And God took care of it. Ethel could have done all kinds of stuff with that money. She only lived in Saugus in a small apartment. She didn't have a whole lot. You know where she finished up her days? Living in a small little place with a family in Maine. I have the picture still in my office. Rocking in a chair and reading a book at 100 years old. You see... She served something greater than Laban's little world. Jacob, it's time to leave him, leave those kind of conditions, and go find a place where faith can grow. How about some challenges here? Number three, third point, challenges. Have you ever tried to quit a sinful habit? And you said, yep, I'm done. And that sin just tucked tail and it ran, didn't it? And it was gone forever, wasn't it? Well, you hope it goes, but it's not going to give up its kingdom. Paul says in Romans, the remaining corruption that you still have, it wants to have dominion over you. It wants to be your master still. And like Laban, Laban comes after Jacob. He's not going to let his little tool get away. Man, my little servant, there's no way I'm going to let him go. And so off he goes to find Jacob. And I want you to listen to his words, verses 25 through 32. What does he say to Jacob? Listen to the deceit. Listen to the, the lies. Laban caught up with Jacob, who took off with his wives, his kids, and everybody else. And now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban and his kinsmen camped in the hill country of Gilead. Then Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? by deceiving me and carrying away my daughters like captives of the sword? And why do you flee secretly to deceive me and do not tell me so? I might have sent you away with joy and with songs and with timbrel and with lyre. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you have done foolishly. It is in my power to do you harm, but the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, be careful not to speak either good or bad to Jacob. Now you have indeed gone away because you longed greatly for your father's house, but why did you steal my gods? And Jacob replied to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. The one with whom you find your gods shall not live in the presence of our kinsmen. Point out what is yours among my belongings and take it for yourself. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Do you hear Laban's little words of deceit? It's all your fault, Jacob. It's your fault. Laban takes no ownership in this. Though Laban has changed his wages how many times? Ten times. Played a game with them. Played a game with his paycheck. This is all your fault, Jacob. He takes, Laban takes no ownership at all in anything that's here. He is white as snow. He is pure as the driven snow, isn't he? He's the victim here. Laban's the one who's hurt. Jacob, you've hurt my heart. You've bruised my soul. Jacob, it's all your fault. Do you ever, do you know someone who's always the perpetual victim? In your family? Or maybe your church family? Is it you? No, just easy. Is it me? Don't be that person, because that's, that's Laban. He's whining and complaining, and oh my goodness, we would have sent you out with a party. Oh, really? Is that what your face was communicating, all contorted as you looked at me? 
Is that really what's going on here? And then he plays the second card, the manipulation of emotion card. You know, you didn't even allow me to kiss my daughters goodbye. I wanted to hug them because I loved them so much. Is that what the daughters think? If I go back to verse 15, I'm not sure Leah and Rachel are getting that kind of communication. Rachel and Leah, those two who are competitive for Jacob's affections, team up and said to him, Do we still have any portion or inheritance in our father's house? Are we not reckoned by him as, as strangers? He's even, he has sold us and has entirely consumed our purchase price. He's used all our dowry money. It, we're nothing to him. We don't even exist in his eyes. What is this talk about getting hugs and kisses before we go on our little journey? He's, he's lying, bold-faced lying. Because if you interview the two girls, it's, maybe it's the middle child thing, I don't know, but hint, hint, just kidding. Um, but it's both daughters. And if you interview both daughters and they're like, Dad, we're, we're, we're invisible to Dad. And here, he, here he's playing the emotional card with Jacob, trying to make him feel guilty, because if he can make him feel guilty, then he can manipulate him to get what he wants from him, because that's Laban's world. How many here want to live in Laban's little world? Laban's little fun house? I don't want to live there, but that's what the world's like. That's what sin will do. It'll play you. It's a cruel puppeteer that has you on the marionette strings and it's, and it's making you, and you're like, what am I doing? Jacob, it's time to go and go home. Don't believe a cruel master and don't follow Laban because he'll play you as much as he possibly can. And then he plays that last card thinking that he's got everything under control because if he can manipulate his feelings about things, then he can open the door and he can zap him with the last challenges you stole from me. You stole from me. And Jacob's just sitting there, listening to all of this take place. You've stolen from my herds. You've done all this. And my goodness. And finally, Jacob responds. Jacob has been quiet. Jacob has been helpful. He is complimented. He has done all that Laban has ever asked him. And then Jacob becomes very, very angry and contended with Laban in verse 36 and said, Listen, buddy, I've had enough. You read his words and the emotiveness, the emotional, he's finished. I'm done here. I'm complete with this. This is no longer what I want to be part of. And he says in verse 36, what is my transgression and what is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? Though you have felt through all my goods that you have found um, all of your household goods, set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen that they may decide between the two of us. These 20 years I have been with you, your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten the rams of your flocks. That which was torn of beast I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. You required it of my hand, whatever stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was by day the heat consumed me and frost by night and my sleep fled from my eyes. These 20 years I have been in your house and I have served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock and you have changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father Abraham, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had not been before me, surely by now you would have sent me away empty handed. God has seen my affliction and the toil of my hands. So he rendered judgment last night. Woohoo! Jacob is hot. He is emotively upset. He is angry. And you need to be angry at the world around you when you find out it's been playing you like a puppet. And you need to emotively make the break and say, I am done. As much as it can be within me, I am finished with this. I am going home. I am going to be with the people of God and I'm going to feed off the treasures with the people of God that I find in this word day after day. I'm heading home because that's what God has commanded. And I love that Jacob says, and God has seen my affliction because he was afflicted. I've seen, and God, God sees it, my friend. When you're at work and you're in your workplace, and I know some of your stories, and it's more than two or three of you because I've talked to many of you, when you feel so abused by the world, he sees it. God saw it. 
Jacob says, if, I, if God had not seen it, you would, have, you would have just sent me with empty hand. But God knows. He sees your toil. He sees what you're going through. And he's watching. He sees it all. And you know, it's not our timing, is it, though? Jacob served how many years? Twenty. Did it sound easy? Ripped off day and night. Bleached by the sun during the day. And chilled by the frost at night. Taking all the loss that took place, he would bear it on himself. And this is the kind of retort that Laban gives to him. You stole from me. Stole from you. I've saved your can how many times? Ever feel that way at work, gentlemen? You saved your business over and over and over, and yet that's the kind of retort you get back. That's the world of Laban. Here's your world. Your soul belongs here with the people of God. Jacob, your soul belongs to Yahweh. It's time to come back. And they close, the last point is they make a covenant, which I don't have a time to get into all the covenant, but you've really got to wonder about Laban's words here. How can Jacob make a covenant with this guy? I mean, this guy has cheated him so often. He might not be able to have Laban not change his words. But if we make a stone wall, a place, a, a memorial where we can see it, he can't change those rocks. And I'm going to have all my kinsmen and all your kinsmen come. And this is going to bear witness together. And as you read through the covenant they make, and I don't have a chance time to read it tonight, you can go back home and read it. You begin to see Jacob initiates the covenant, but then Laban, he still can't get away from himself. He's still the lead spokesman here. And he's saying stuff like this. You've got to promise me before your God that you will not take any more wives than the two you already have. And you've got to promise me that you're not going to harm my children. Who is harming the children? Do you get the impression from the story that Jacob's children were living in Grandpa's palace? Laban's, you know, hot tub, swimming pool, and drinks? No, it sounds like that the grandkids were, and, and, and the daughters were, were living with Jacob, kind of scratching out a living, and Jacob's telling, Laban's telling Jacob, make sure you don't harm them. You're the one who's been harming them. And you, you read things like, what in the world? But this covenant is made, and a promise is made, and the separation is now done. Laban, I'm done with you. I'm finished. So this is, the, this is what I can draw from the story. There's probably a whole lot more, but I read through Calvin. I read through a few other guys and try to come up with something. How many here want to serve Laban? Oh, come on, somebody. Somebody that we can help counsel afterwards. <laughs> no one wants to serve Laban. He's a cheat. He's going to use you. He's going to suck you dry of your life. By the way, that's the world, okay? It's deception. Sin is deception. That's the evil one's game. He plays us. He offers us life, and it's really death. And so we don't want to. We don't want to play with the world. I was done by God's grace forty years ago, this summer, and I'm so grateful that God gave me the grace to say, I'm done. I was really kind of angry, to be honest with you, because I realized as a young man that everything that was being thrown at me as the answers to all the questions and thirsts of my soul was all just a big joke, because none of it really actually worked. I was being a puppet on a string, dancing with my friends to the tune of the evil one, and I didn't even know it. And finally, I was like, I'm finished with this. I'm gone. And off I went. He went 500 miles. I traveled 1,200 miles. Okay? I'm just saying, okay? 1,200 miles all the way to Alabama to Bible college. You don't have to go to Bible college, but you just need to leave the world of Laban. You can't serve two masters. And I'll tell you Christians all the time, sometimes we use this analogy, I got one foot in the world and one foot in the church. Usually it's one foot in the world and a toenail maybe in the church. That's not going to work. Okay? We have to be in the world. We have to do our things in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. We have a chance to listen to five testimonies this morning. I pray you stick around just to hear them. They've been a gracious people. Got love to get to know them. They've been fun, enjoyable. And uh, they're, they're, they're telling us that they've, they've left the world of Laban. And they've gone back to the land of promise. So I pray that's your story as well. Let's pray. God, thanks for the word. Thanks for the truth.
help Jacob's life to be an inspiration to us. Help us to go beyond the information, Lord, to transform our hearts now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.